Movie. Before we start the meeting, um, I do just want to point out again, yes, we are unmasked just so that you guys are able to hear us. Um, we all do have our masks at our stations. We do have, we're six feet apart and then some, but we all do have shields. I know it's hard to see in the cameras, um, but there are shields between all of us. And if we leave our spot, we will have our masks on. Um, so to begin, can I get an adoption of the agenda for the November 24th Committee of the Whole Meeting with the addition, uh, addition of the sundry item G1? Councillor Byer had had her arm up there. Um, all those in favor? Any questions, concerns? Oh. All those in favor? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Can I get an adoption of the minutes of the November 10th, 2020 Committee of the Whole Meeting? Councillor Wilkinson will make that. Uh, anybody see any concerns? All those in favor? Fantastic. Um, and first off, we have our delegation, the Kineticor Cascade Power Plant Project. And I believe we have Rob and Gordon online joining us. That's that's correct. As well as uh, Jim Clark, uh, I believe uh, from uh, BPC. Oh, fantastic! Thank you for joining us. We're just getting getting you set up so we can see you here. Oh, I don't know if you want to see us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, are you good to go? Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We are excited to see the update. Can you see this slide? We can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want me to start then, Gord? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, James is gonna start. Uh, with this presentation. So my name is Jim Clark. I'm a project director of the joint venture. The joint venture is 50% PCL from Edmonton and 50% Black and Beach, which is uh, headquartered in Kansas City. Um, but the group that is doing the work on this project are actually in Ann Arbor outside of Detroit. There's essentially um, two halves to the joint venture uh, Black and Beach do all of the engineering design. They do the procurement of all the major equipment and PCL obviously does the construction portion. As a joint venture, we've done probably almost half a dozen of these power projects now in North America. So we're, uh, we're well used to each other. Um, and then just back up a little bit bigger picture on Gord's behalf the three main parties, and I'll get into that a little later, but the three main parties so that you guys understand is the um, Kineticor are the owner representing the limited partnership for the project. So Kineticor Resources represents Cascade, which is the basically the owner and operator of the plant. And then there's two major parties. They have purchased all the centerline power equipment from Siemens and then all of the design, build, construction, startup is all done by the joint venture BPC, which is Black and & Beach and PCO. We like to start out every meeting, every time that we're together with any group within our organization, outside of our organization and have a safety moment. I'm gonna go a little um, sideways on that one and just share with you the overall project theme. Our reputation for safety is the one we are, and this is the theme that we will be carrying as the overarching sort of concept of safety throughout the project. And it's a different way of writing, um, do what you say, not, not just, uh, just talk. So very quickly on the safety side, the site HSE manager of Steve Haggett, he's been with PCL quite some time. He's out of Lacombe. Um, for the project, we obviously have a site specific safety plan. Site orientation and mobilization requirements are followed by our employees, by our joint venture, by the owners people and by all of the subcontractors that come onto the site. Obviously, we're implementing the latest COVID-19 guidelines and PCL as an organization has a 
a task force within the group where we're operating throughout North America and managing all of the COVID-19 issues. And obviously, even as late as 4.30 today, there's constantly changing guidelines and requirements. And um, we're doing very well so far. We have not had any cases on the site. It's a very small population right now and they're mo primarily in mobile equipment. So um, we're in a good place right now and continue to work along as planned. Once we get up and going, we're gonna have on-site medical services probably um, at sometime in first quarter of next year. In the meantime, we've gone around and, and met with all the first responders. We've met with the hospital, with the RCMP, with the fire department, um, some of the local doctor services like an optometrist and a dentist so that we have them on call if we have an event. But we have online on-site medical services, which is basically a paramedic level. They'll respond immediately while we wait for the uh, main responders to land. And we've even coordinated a landing spot with STARS. Obviously, we have to look after all of the Alberta environment requirements, and there's lots of permits and guidelines and rules around this project. And we have to manage on behalf of the owner, the permit compliance. Where we're also doing design of the balance of plant, obviously there's safety in design, there's has up studies and specialty work instructions and all that goes along with that to make sure that the plant starts up properly and operates properly. And then finally, we're also doing the commissioning and the startup of this unit. And we will be training outside of the centerline equipment. Obviously Siemens will train Gordon Robb's people on the centerline equipment, but we do the balance of plant and how it all ties in together. This is the general arrangement that you will eventually see when this place is finished. The two stacks that you see are on the back end of the HERSIG. Within the building or is the in the generation building. So these are two 450 megawatt lines. There's a generator with a combustion turbine on the north end that feeds the exhaust gas into the HERSIG that makes steam that goes back and then feeds the steam turbines. The combustion turbine, and the steam turbine are on a single shaft. And out of that generator, you get 450 megawatts times two, it's 900 megawatts. And then the big pieces of equipment at the back are the air-cooled condensers. So this is a completely closed cycle as opposed to the power plants that you would be familiar with at Wavaman. We do not take in any water to condense the steam. This is, those are essentially a giant radiator with fans to condense the steam off of the HERSIGs back into water and it circles around. So it's a closed cycle. Um, the project team for Kineticore, the project director is Gord McNeil. For my, I'm um, the uh, BPC project director, and then Siemens have a general project manager as well. So under Kineticore, they have Burns and McDonald as their owner's engineer, and they'll be the technical oversight and do review and approval of everything that we design and build. Gord also has his own group of people inside and he'll speak to that in a second. On our side, we have the uh, design group, which is in Ann Arbor primarily. Some work is done in India, some is done in Kansas City, some is done in Edmonton, some is done in Denver, but primarily it is all headquartered out of Detroit. And then on our side, the site construction management is all the PCL people out of Edmonton. And then the Siemens people are really spread all over the world. The Hersigs are out of Holland, the turbines are out of Orlando. Some of the gear comes from Korea, so they're spread all over the world. So there's a, a huge international influx of personalities and stuff coming into the small little town of Edson in northern Alberta. Maybe, Gord, you just want to say a few words about your lineup of people as the owner. Yeah, it's uh, James uh, Gord McNeil, project director for Kineticore and we have a, a core group of people headquartered right now in our Calgary offices, although after today, it may be in our Calgary homes. Um, so there, our plan is to, throughout the course of this winter, we'll be primarily uh, stationed in Calgary and then transitioning and also supplementing our staff. In the spring, we'll move to site, uh, set up a fairly substantial site office there and work hand in hand with James and his crew um, throughout the uh, the course of the construction, startup and commissioning of the project. Um, 
although James and his and his companies uh, do the lion's share of the work. At the end of the day, when the project is finished and everybody goes home, uh, everybody goes home but Kineticor. Kineticor are here for the long run. Uh, we're going to be here for the operation of the plant and looking forward to uh, to a long and, and uh, fruitful relationship with the folks of Edson and the surrounding area. Just to go on to the project schedule, we mobilized on September 1st and started right away on the earthworks. We wanted to get a good run at the ground before um, the frozen winter weather hit us. And we so we ran 12 hours a day, seven days a week up until today, which was the very first day of piling. We will be uh, working on a seven day basis until the 18th of December where we'll shut down and then start up again on the 5th of January. Through the winter then we will be doing piling until the 1st of April where we start concrete and then we start that main generation building in June. The first of the major gear which you'll see arrive in the town by rail it will be the big components of the Hersigs. Then the turbines come in January, the generator comes in February, the steam turbines come in March, and the ACCs come in April. Most of those big pieces of equipment you'll see come into the CN siding in the south part of town. And we have heavy haul arranged through uh, Next Gen out of Atchison. And they'll be bringing all that from the rail um, to the site. And then the ACC actually comes as 360 sea cans. So you'll see a lot of freight coming through the town. Um, and then the plan is natural gas is available around September of 22. Backfeed power in November. We'll be doing testing. We'll fire the boilers first in March. First fire the Hersigs in April. So the big picture is we started on September of 2020. Guaranteed completion for Mr. McNeil is on September 15th of 2023 when we pass him the keys. And I'm sure all of you will be interested in knowing sort of the population of workers. So right now we're less than two dozen on site. Throughout next summer and into the fall, we'll probably be 200. Then that'll ramp up about the spring of 22 probably more like June, where you'll see from June of 22 to July of 23 of about 600 workers on site. And then we'll ramp down as we do the startup and the commissioning. Like I said, the engineering is done out of, uh, is managed out of Ann Arbor. Um, there is an overall design plan that has been submitted to the owner. Um, project management and detailed design in Ann Arbor, some detailed design in Kansas City and Edmonton, the high voltage in Portland, Oregon and Denver, Colorado. Field construction support is by our PCL group out of Edmonton and there's a significant amount of detailed design done in Pune, India. And then the model design reviews uh, are done with the Connecticut people in Calgary and then the Burns and McDonald people, a lot of them in Houston. And then there's collaboration with Siemens and their um, Hersig manufacturer, HTT out of Holland. So it's truly a worldwide effort. And many times we're having these Zoom meetings now and we're crossing about seven time zones all in one meeting. Obviously, as part of all the design, there's also the constructability part. You have to make sure that there's safety in building it, there's safety in running it. There's, you know, efficiencies and quality have to be kept in mind. And just because you draw it doesn't mean you can build it. And that's where the constructability comes through here and where we evaluate all of the design. There's lots of implementation of lessons learned, Canadian requirements for ABSA building, Alberta Building Code, Environment Canada. Clearly there's an interdependency of design with seasonal construction issues. Um, building one of these in Florida, which we do a lot, is very, very different than doing it in Alberta. However, I will tell you the entire group, including myself, have come down out of Fort McMurray after almost 20 years up there. So we're pretty used to this now. A big piece of 
the whole community relationship is not only with the town of Edson, but it's also the indigenous relations, um, you know, recognition of the treaty lands, engagement of indigenous communities and business. And uh, we take this very serious. A lot of people just give the indigenous participation lip service. And I am proud to say that in this project, that is not the case. Um, there are six bands that we are uh, working with on a continuous basis. Those pictures on the right are pictures of the blessing that we had just a couple of weeks ago. That's Andrew with the toque on in the background and, and representatives of the six nations. When I say there's serious and tangible benefits to the indigenous communities, they've invested nearly $100 million into this project of their money. And in terms of business relationships, the Earthworks subcontractor that's on site now, Backwoods, is entirely owned by the Alexis First Nation. Alexis is providing our security, which is 24 seven for the next three years. The paramedic med online medic on-site medical service is provided through Alexis. The Enoch band have a whole bunch of mobile earth moving equipment on site. The uh, surveyor group in line who do survey and geotechnical um, testing for us are all owned by Enoch. And there's literally a couple of dozen smaller vendors and suppliers that are all indigenous companies that we are actively engaging them for their services. So like I said, it, it's there's tangible participation here. It's not just, yeah, we had a ceremony and signed a piece of paper and, and all thought that was sufficient. Uh, the procurement is done in two pieces within the joint venture. All of what we call the tag equipment. So all the major pieces of equipment, um, specialty instrumentation, the electrical e-houses, you see a picture of one there on the right being delivered. All of those very specific designed engineered pieces are procured out of Ann Arbor. And then the construction subcontracts and all the bulks like electrical tray, cable, uh, bulk piping, that's all purchased out of our Edmonton office. Obviously, um, when there's a project of this size announced, there are many, many, many vendors of all size from large to small to international to lo local family run operations. We have one website there where everybody is directed to to submit you know, the services they can offer and their contact information and stuff like that. And I can tell you that personally, um, I am the one that goes through every single one of those. And I've probably gone through four or 500 of them now where, you know, and I'll be perfectly honest, there's lots of, lots of them there where we can use the services. We're engaging in local vendors and local businesses in, in every opportunity that we can. There are some people that come and offer services that I'll be very frank that we do ourselves. So we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't subcontract. There's a, a huge electrical contractor in the city of Edmonton that, you know, comes and they say, we would like to offer our services. Well, that's great, but you're our competitor. We self, we uh, do this with self hired employees. So we wouldn't, you know, we don't say yes to absolutely everything, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. And then there's lots of logistics plan for getting a lot of these huge, huge pieces. You will see some extremely large heavy haul vehicles bringing some of these components that are five and 600 tons coming out of the rail yard on the south side of town and up to the site. And then there's obviously the logistics plans for all the other smaller items. So then for the construction, this is an aerial view and this was taken about a month back. So you'll see in the lower left hand corner, our current temporary construction facilities and it's only a half dozen trailers and a wash car. Eventually there will be substantial complexes built for ourselves as the joint venture for the Siemens group, for the Kineticor group. There'll be all of the lunchroom facilities, a warehouse, a shop facility are all around the perimeter of this, of this plant. Um, that's Highway 47 on the left. In the upper right-hand corner is the stormwater pond, which 
during construction and then for the permanent plant, all surface runoff goes to that pond and it has a big gate structure that controls the water outflow of that so that you don't have siltation going to the river. The square sort of at the 12 o'clock point, that is where the Hersigs, that's the power block. And then south of that will be the ACCs. And then at the very bottom will they be the high voltage switchyard. And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to show you a quick video, which is a drone flight. And we do the drone flight every week. We have the, our own drone on site. So before I start it, you're looking Highway 47 is on the left and uh, the power block is at the upper right hand corner and that's the lunch trailer and office of the piling guy that subcontractor that just started today. And that's the boro pit right in front of you. So we'll just take a quick flight over here. So that's the boro pit where we removed all the material for the power block and we're now filling it in with all the organics that we and some of the spoils material that we pulled off. And I can tell you that already um, just in three days, we put over 1300 loads in that. So this work advances very quickly. You'll see the access road in that white snowy part that we've partially done and then stopped and we'll finish that in the spring. We're now going- hey James, to I don't know if anybody else can see it, but I'm not getting the video. Neither am I. Oh. Okay. Not Sorry, we're unable to see the video. All right, let me try something else then. I guess, uh, well, it was going to be a flyover of actually that still picture. So that's too bad. I can't seem to get it. To, <laughs> that's OK. So. Thank you for trying. I, I love Zoom. It's really nice. <laughs> you, do have, you do have a copy of the presentation with, with the video that's embedded in it if you want to look at it later. Well, perfect. Thank you very much. OK, well, I'll, I'll keep going then. I won't bore with me fighting with Zoom. Um, the main team on construction then, is Paul Gorey is the site manager, works directly under myself. Um, Paul and I just finished a power, pro power project in Grand Cache about four months ago, so we're a pretty tight team, worked many years together. Dan Satiga is the construction manager. Bridge Chad is our risk manager and sort of looks after a lot of the commercial items. Ken Hanley is probably our most senior general superintendent in PCL Industrial right now. He's on the project. And I mentioned Steve Haggett. He is our most senior um, site HSE manager, and he's on the project as well. So you have literally decades and decades and decades of experience in this group. Um, the path of construction, it's basically uh, two parallel lines that are built in parallel with about a 30-day offset of each other. There is... Um, Predominantly, we direct hire most of the craft. I would say only 10 to 15% of the work is subcontracted and all that we subcontract is earthworks piling, the heavy hauling cranes, which will be my shack at Avachis and the piling is Solitash Bashi, which is the old agri group. Earthworks is backwoods out of Edmonton and they have a big shop in Edson. Um, and then we subcontract insulation and the high voltage is done by Midlight out of Fort McMurray. And then PCL Buildings has the contract to do the design build for the admin and the control room building. Um, the quality and the turnover, obviously, in this day of uh, digital quality management, it's an ongoing thing. There will be literally tens of thousands of inspection and test records of every single thing that we do. There are two quality managers, one on site, Scott Camplin, who um, worked with me on the Mass of Fort Hills project up north. Very extensive experience. And then Amy Restrepo works out of the engineering office and focuses mainly on the uh, procurement. And quality plans, 
and all of the related permits for natural gas codes, CSA, ABSA, Canadian Electrical Code, Alberta Building Code, those are all uh, looked after by ourselves and then passed to Gorge Group for review. Commissioning and startup, this is a, another unique feature of the joint venture. So Black and Beach have a start, an entire startup team. So they come in and PCL will supply the craft support for these specialty technicians and staff people. They're most, there's a couple of them out of Canada. Many of them are US based out of Kansas City and they'll come up for the, the checkout, the commissioning. We'll manage the lockout tagout program as they go through and do the checkout on the mechanical electrical instrument control on the DCS system and work together with all the Siemens people on the center line and the HERSIGs. And as after we start to get closer to startup and the commissioning is nearing the end, Gord's operations and maintenance group will sort of tie into us. And it's a very interactive type of training program where we'll sit at the board and they'll watch what we do. And then eventually we kind of step back and they step forward and sort of take over the training with them, us looking over their shoulder. So it's, there's classroom training and then there's very interactive training as we get up and running. And the entire project after this year works on a 10 and four schedule. So you'll see all the influx of people into your town on a Tuesday morning, Monday night, Tuesday morning, they work 10 days and then they leave on Thursday evening the next Thursday evening for their four days off. That 10 and four schedule is going to continue all through 2021 through 2022 and probably up to sometime at the end of the second quarter of 23. When we get into the third quarter of 23, the summer of 23, that's when we'll start to do the commissioning. There will be um, lots of activity that then becomes continuous. So then we go from 10 and four to seven days a week, day shift only. And then all of a sudden it's seven days a week around the clock. So, but predominantly in 21 and 22 and half of 23, you're gonna see an influx of 10 and four. The interconnection of the facility with the outside world. So the high voltage connects to the Altalink sub, which is only 2000 meters south of us and that will be a small transmission line that will be built to do that final connection. And then there's a number of gas pipelines. So there's one that will come from, tie into TC Energy, which has about a seven kilometer run, which we'll be managing. We're still finalizing the design of that. So that'll run from TC Energy's tie point on the west side of town to the site. Uh, there will be one from Repsol and one from Pado, and they will all tie into the plant site. And that would be just about it. That's essentially, uh, that's the billboard you'll see it on the lower part of the hill as you're traveling south on 47. And that's what the place is gonna look like in about 30 some months. Perfect. Thank you very much. That was very detailed and exciting. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to questions for the councillors. Okay. Councillor Wilkinson. Through the chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed that. Uh, when you have your crews in town, will they be in the camp or will they be using facilities in Edson? So what we have done is we have purposely um, not built a camp for this project. We did some initial studies. And when we did the initial study, we realized that we're following behind the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline. There is a camp facility, 600 beds built by Right Choice. They built it for the pipeline, but they have engaged with us to, to say that that will probably be available the latter part of next year when we start to ramp up and they're gonna run it like a hotel situation. So there's opportunity there. Our studies have shown just in hotel rooms that are available to rent. Now, I mean, there's various activities, but the gas field business is very slow. It's 
mostly the, the pipeline business right now that are occupying those rooms. But between Edson and Hinton, there's around 1160 rooms of hotels available. Then obviously there's the RV parks in the summer and that, that doesn't take into account apartments or facilities or rooms that people want to rent out. So between the, the right choice camp, the available hotel space and the other facilities that are available and the concept of the RV parks between Edson and Hinton, um, we think there's probably three or four times the capacity that we would ever need. And the timing kind of works that we're following behind the Trans Mountain in terms of large numbers. So what we are doing is we're offering LOA. It's no secret. Each worker gets $140 a day for every day work plus another 15 per day for gas. So he basically gets $150 every 10 day rotation to pay for gas from wherever his home is. And um, that LOA is available for lodging and, and meals. Thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate it. I did talk to a local business and they were quite excited about having a tentative contract to supply you with some items. So thank you for engaging with the local businesses. Yeah, we, we've, we've reached out to them. We've had an awful lot approach us and we've also reached out. Actually, one of our main uh, procurement people in the Edmonton office is a former resident of Edson and and uh, through her just years of business, she seems to know just about every vendor in the Edson and Hinton area. So you have lots of representation uh, right at the other end of the phone, so. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mayor Sayer. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation here today. Maybe you can speak a little bit about uh, how this is gonna benefit some of our uh, natural gas producers and some of the agreements you have with them. Well, I'm going to let Gord speak to that because by the time I pass in the keys, I've burnt very little gas. Today. <laughs> that'll be that'll be his deal. So, Gord, maybe you can tell yeah. tell him on your agreements that you have. Thanks, James. So we have agreements in place right now with TC Energy and with uh, Pado for supply of gas to the plant. Uh, the gas, when it's up and running at full load, it's going to take a substantial amount of gas and. The, the design for this plant is to run uh, um, base load, which means it's going to be running 900 megawatts most of the time. So substantial gas uh, consumer. Um, we won't get into too much into the details of the contracts with the gas uh, suppliers. That's, uh, that's confidential, but nonetheless, we are, we are going to be utilizing uh, two to three suppliers in the area and taking quite a bit of gas. Well, just to put it in perspective, the gas line to the site is 16 inch. So you can appreciate a 16 inch gas line running full flow is a serious amount of gas used. Thank you very much for that. I think that's uh, one of the pieces that people often forget that there's going to be spinoff benefits to our uh, natural gas sector, which is so important right now. Absolutely. Especially where this unit is base load. It's not a peaker. It doesn't swing. It just pulls on that line all day, all night, just steady. Um, I had a question. Do you have any concerns about the project schedule with what's going on uh, with the pandemic and just with knowing so much of your supplies are coming um, internationally? Um, I will tell you, so a couple things. On site, we have some contingencies built into our schedule. The fact that we're on a 10 and four and days only, we have the opportunity to maybe with select and small crews do select pieces of work on a night shift or do them on the four days off or whatever. So if we get into trouble, we have opportunity there to make up. Um, during COVID, assuming God willing that the vaccines eventually put a stake in this by the end of next year. We're not huge numbers up until that point in time. We've, you know, we're following the protocols. We have three times as much lunchroom space to do the social distancing in the lunchroom. We have twice as many washrooms. Instead of cleaning once a day, we're cleaning three times a day. That's all built into our plan. It's all built into the project costs. So I'm, you know, we're, we're working the best we can 
if I w- if I knew what was going to happen, I certainly wouldn't be doing this. I'd be sitting on a beach picking lottery numbers. But the you know we're we're set up the best we know how. We follow the regulations, and I think with a population of about two hundred people through next year, we we should be fine. We've got many projects with multiples of that operating and without issue. Um, I think part part of the question as well was about the equipment deliveries and. As far as the major equipment, yeah, the steam turbine. Yeah. What's that? Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. As far as the major equipment that Siemens is supplying, um, we've made great efforts to get Siemens to place those orders as early as possible, so that in the event that if there was a, a COVID uh, situation and they had a uh, you know a break in the supply chain for a couple of weeks, we've got enough float in there to accommodate that. The other thing is uh, Siemens have a, a very wide reaching uh, procurement net around the world. And we're careful in choosing what countries that they, uh, they, they get the equipment from. If it's a high risk country that's got a lot of COVID issues, then there's alternative uh, areas where, where things can be uh, procured. And we're doing the same thing when we evaluate the balance of planet gear that we're buying. Um, Obviously, you look at quality, you look at price, you look at what you're getting in terms of the physical asset. But one of the key questions is, where is this thing coming from? And how are you going to get it? And there have been, I will, I will be open with you that there have been a few items that we could get it cheaper from a place like Spain or Italy and said, no, thank you. We'll get it from the U.S. for a little bit more money, but have a little bit more confidence that we will get it when we need it. And that's part of the evaluation through the procurement. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? All right, I think we're good here. Well, I'll just say thank you very much. Um, It was very interesting to see and we're excited to hear more updates as the project moves along. Okay, sorry about the video, but we'll figure it out for next time. (laughs) Sounds good. We can all watch it here after. You're just looking at a bunch of snow anyway, so. Have a great evening. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, moving on to reports from staff. So corporate services, the citizen budget results. Is that you, Mr. Passy? Mm-hmm. So once again, this year we ran the citizen budget tool. Um, We ran it um, from October 29th until November 15th, 2020. There's a little typo that I missed there. Um, This year we had um, 233 people access the tool, um, but only 89 responses that were submitted. So that is an increase from last year. We only had 62 responses, uh, responses submitted. Um, so it's nice to see that more people are submitting their answers using the tool and, and, and going forward with that. So we're hoping next year we break the 100 mark. We're hoping this year. But, um, so we'll dive right in. Um, the questions on it uh, had different departments and then asking whether they whether someone would like to uh, increase, decrease, or maintain the funding at the same amount. Um, so for the fire department, um, Majority of people wanted to leave it staying in the status quo, and then a little bit of on either side of that. Um, for bylaw, again, the majority on status quo, um, 36% in favor of, of uh, decreasing funding, and 23% in, on increased funding. Um, and then for the RCMP, again, mostly staying the same, um, and then a little heavier on the increased funding towards that. And then there's just a summary of the comments that were submitted in that section. Um, more funds to RCMP over peace officers. People would like to see RCMP and peace officers do more. Uh, some of these are necessary. Cut funding, issue more fines to generate more revenue, better response time needed, or um, and two fire departments in town is inefficient. Um, they move on to community services, unless you want to 
Does council have any questions at that point, or I can go through the presentation all the way through, or go through? Okay. Um, community services. Uh, we'll start with FCSS. Um, Thirty-eight percent wanted to have funding lowered. Thirty-seven percent stay the same, and twenty-four percent uh, towards increased funding. Um, <clears throat> parks is one where we saw a majority again um, wanting to decrease funding. We're at thirty-eight percent. Staying the same, and then a little bit of increased funding on some of those. Community development, again, um, majority wanting or, or indicating uh, support for lowering funding, 36% maintaining the same, and 17 increasing. For Repsol Place, the majority leaving that at, uh, at the same where it is, and then 41% for lowering. And then the summary of comments for that area. Uh, consider contracting out services, upgrade current recreation facility, these programs are not essential, more user pay models, more funds into programming, or, and FCSS for preventative measures, less focus on parks and ball diamonds, remove green shacks, more programming for young families, and not necessary for town staff to move to old boys and girls club building. Uh, for infra infrastructure services, uh, for the roads and for the snow removal, um, majority wanting to either have the same or um, increase funding for that. Um, for waste collection, majority having to say the same, and 40% um, indicating a decreased amount to that. And for the landfill, again, majority being okay with where it's at, and some for lowering. And then the summary of those comments, uh, more street maintenance, focus on existing infrastructure, improve snow removal practices, more street and sidewalk maintenance, improve inf infrastructure to prevent flooding, Implementation of curbside recycling, more frequent waste collection, less frequent organics collection. Utilities team does a great job and improve road design. Um, so on this, the majority of um, ones are, are leaving at the same, and a few where the majority want to decrease funding. But overall, um, the the Ethelo, who was the company we went through, uh, indicated that it's um, high support for what it has been uh, presented as in this, in this situation. Perfect, thank you. Open the floor to questions. Councilor Breyer. Uh, thank you, uh, through the chair to uh, Mr. Passy. Um, at the, I, so I have a, I have a question. Um, I, I suppose I'm a little bit confused. So um, I, I did the tool myself to have a, a good understanding to explain it to other people how to, how to use it, but I, I, I did the visitor section um, because I didn't want my name on it. I didn't leave any comments. Um, so when I submit that, it said it was submitted. Is that then a total under the visitors and not actually in the responses? Or is that just how many people visited the website? It's um, So the 89 responses are for ones that selected and hit submit. If, the, if someone didn't hit submit, then it wouldn't be counted as a response. If you visited the website and did all of the, the sliders, but didn't hit submit, then it would not count that. Okay, okay. Hmm. okay. Councilor Wilkinson. Through the chair, mostly a comment. Do you have any great ideas of how we can get greater participation? I mean, 89 people in the whole town of Edson, to me, really is very small to base percentages on. Um, we can't can't force people to do it, um, but it's it's getting it out there and encouraging people to do it. And we did put out a uh, prize package for people who could participate. Mm -hmm. um, but they, I think with Ethelo, they they have the ability to do some targeted ads to try to get people to 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 participate. Um, but it comes down to whether people just decide to or not to. Mm -hmm. Just would to me. It empowers people that we actually can listen to this, like as to what they give us. And also, I wondered about um, them wanting the um, recycling picked up curbside, just to have that really plain that that would be commingled. And I don't know, Councillor Schnard, but no more than I. But I hear at times the commingled just goes into a landfill because there isn't a sorting process for it. So I think people need to realize that that. It may be the answer for people just to put it out in the blue bag, but it isn't really the answer for the environment. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I'll just add to Mr. Passy's comment. Um, uh, so I remember when we did this um, the very first year, we only had 26 respondents, and, and we were talking about 
um, uh, how uh, how we can make sure that this is a meaningful tool um, and uh, how hard it is to kind of consider basing decisions on a re relatively small sample size. Um, I believe one of the ways that council can really continue to encourage people's participation is to actually incorporate these pieces of information into your decision making and demonstrate to the people that this is a meaningful exercise and a meaningful act. Um, obviously that needs to be in proportion to the amount of people that participate but i think that is one thing that can help people to see that it will be worth their time um, when it actually impacts outcomes in terms of, of the principles that council uses in their financial management mm -hmm. Mayor Sarah? yeah through the chair uh, uh to councillor wilkinson's point too i think one of the things we talked about as well is uh, doing the citizen budget tool earlier on in the process which i think will help It'll give us more time to maybe talk with our community and say, hey, now is the time to provide that info before we start developing the budget. Uh, people are getting more used to this tool. As we can see through the comments and, and some of that stuff, we have to do a better job educating on green shacks don't cost the town of any money at all. <laughs> um, you know, things like that, they're, they're small pieces. Um, and and uh, quite frankly, uh, we're dealing with a multi million dollar budget here, and it's hard to. Uh, explain the nuances of, of each section and each department and how all that works. But I am pleasantly surprised to see growth every year. Um, and I think it's just going to be an ongoing ongoing effort. Um, I know we've talked about maybe doing some uh, virtual town halls as well. I think that'll be really good for next year before we get into this process to help promote. I know that I was talking with some nonprofits and every meeting, I think we all need to do that is when we're engaging with the public, tell them about the budget tool tell them to go there, tell them to uh, tell them to provide that input. So um, we're, we're continuing to, to increase the numbers and I think that's a good thing. Thanks. Um, just can you say again, how many were visited? Was that? Uh, 233. Um, and just any question, was there any, um, like I, this year I didn't do it, I've done it in years past, but I, I didn't want to make a mistake um, <laughs> in their game. but. Is or is it really clear about the spitting part? Just knowing we had that many visit versus um, that many responses. So is it really clear for it to be submitted? Uh, in the beginning, there it, there's there's wording where it says submit yeah. your budget okay. to have your okay. voice heard. Um, whether that's clear enough to say if you don't submit it, it won't be included. You know, it's hard to say, but it does okay. say submit to okay. have your first voice heard. And at the end. It has a submit button. Okay, perfect. Okay. I would also suggest that it's more likely, like, as soon as someone enters that site, they're now counted as a visit, and it's more likely that they enter and leave immediately rather than yeah. do all the work to fill it all out and then just don't yeah. push the button at the bottom. I think that's probably not very likely um, relative to people who kind of go there and then just be like, ah, I'm not going to do this and, and leave. Two-thirds of the responses came through Facebook, and so, you know, it could be they saw it come up on, on the town's... Uh, Facebook page and click it, go into it, then decide to leave it because they want to keep scrolling. You know, who, you know can't, yeah. can't say exactly what they're doing, but it's yeah. one of those things. As soon as they go into it, it counts, but then they don't go any further than it. That, that makes sense. Okay, sounds good. I thought it was interesting that the um, comments all tended to be 50 50. Like it was for or against, and it was, and so many of them were contradicting mm -hmm. each other, mm -hmm. um, which just goes to we can never please everyone, right? Um, anyone else have any further comments? Uh, Councilor Breyer? Oh, thanks. Uh, through the chair to Council and Admin. Um, I, I was surprised to see um, uh, with the, the parks that, uh, although that was one, one thing that when we did our COVID budget uh, and, and cutting that, and also um, the changes that we've made to the parks and, and the grass cutting, um, that people weren't complaining about, you know, that we didn't have any comments saying, you know, you didn't cut the grass enough this year. Um, that they were, you know, saying that it, that they're either happy or they could require less service in that. Um, and then also with the, the ball diamond changes that we're anticipating to make that, you know, that's a direction I think that, you know, is, is good to head in, you know, th those changes have been recognized and, and um, you know, kind of follow through with some of the comments here. So, agree. Just to comment, I was shocked with the snow removal not being good you go to other towns, I think ours is just stellar. And so it just shocked me when people think it isn't good. So it's nice to hear all these comments, really. And mm -hmm. then you realize what people are concerned about. Yeah, I agree. Anyone else? 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Passy. Moving on to the 2021 budget. Are you staying up or are we getting? Tonight's my night. It's your night. <laughs> Did you lose? <laughs> the toss or? Just kidding, just kidding, Mrs. Bittman. Okay, so we had the budget workshop um, in mid-October, and from that, council indicated that um, to be kind of supportive of a around a 2.5% um, taxation increase. Um, and then there was also discussion around the $2 charge for the stormwater being removed from taxation and then put off the utility bills. Um, so with that information, we went to work and, and we got to 2.52%. Um, and that is included in using um, $280,000 from the most grant. Um, and then from that, when we then we took out the, the funds for the $2, um, stormwater charge was about $70,000. It got up to the taxation increase being 1.9%. Um, and then also what you'll see is um, there's been $20,000 $20, put into the parks budget that was just an omission when we got to the budget workshop uh, for park benches. Um, it was going to be in the capital budget, then it's going to be an operating budget. We moved it from one, we moved it from the other. It just got shuffled around, so we just want to make sure that it's clear that that's been put back into the operational budget and funded from a reserve, so it won't affect taxation anyway. Um, I also wanted to pull up... in talking about the most grant. Um, I left it on my desk. Um, but it's the it's in your agenda. It's and just one page. Just the one page of the most grant utilization. Um, so that grant that we received um, in regards to funding um, shortcomings and, and revenue shortages from the um, from this past year. Um, to use the two hundred eighty thousand in in twenty twenty one to remove that subsidization um, in four equal parts over the next four years. It ends up using seven hundred thousand dollars of that that amount, which was a total of eight hundred fifty-seven. So that's just to let council know that um, if this is the way that council wants to go in, in the next few years to to remove that subsidization, subsidization, um, there's only a little bit of that grant that could be used for other other things, other initiatives, um, other relief practices, or whatever it may be. But seven hundred thousand of it would need to be directly allocated to removing that subsidization from taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, in this budget, it's also had removed the tax stabilization uh, amount, which was, I believe, three hundred forty thousand um, dollars in twenty twenty. That was no longer we're no longer using that amount uh, from that reserve to offset taxes. Um, so administration feels this is a very good way to remove that subsidization. subsidization um, but it just is a few year medium term commitment to do that. Um, and then as far as capital budget, um, attaches the proposed budget for that as well. Um, three items were removed from the capital budget and put into the operating budget, being the, uh, the, uh, the facility furnace replacement, um, the asbestos inspection, and the engineering design standards. And we moved those from the capital uh, budget to the operating budget because they don't meet the threshold of creating an asset that we usually consider being the, uh, the capital budget. Um, and so that they were then funded through the operating budget and through reserve. So again, they have no impact on taxation. And then if there's no further changes tonight, then this would be what the budget that is presented to council next week for passing. Okay. I just may add to that as I typically try to um, just remind council that tonight is kind of the last night for major um, budget deliberations that would give us time to incorporate 
um, any significant adjustments that budget might, or sorry, that council might like to see to the budget so that we can incorporate those in, in advance of presenting um, a proposed budget for adoption um, at next week's meeting. Thank you. Um, really quickly, Mr. Pressy, how much was the total amount of the most grant again? 857,000. All right, open it up to council. Mr. Schnard. Okay, um, on this 2.5 through chair to Mike, um, did we factor in if we're going to, I'm just trying to find out here, if we continue on the path we are now with the 0.9, so in the last year we were doing savings. So when we go into 2021, did we factor in how much savings we'd save if we follow what we've been doing now? No, this budget assumes a full, uh, full schedule. Full schedule moving back. Um, can I do a follow up on that? Yes. Okay. Um, I see we're at 2.5. I wasn't in favor of them. I'm still not in favor of it because I think we need to, it's going to take us time to recover to get back. And then where we kind of put smoke in mirrors, we go from 2.5 to 1.9, but they still pay $2. So either way, it's still a cost savings. I would like to see trimmed down to a point, or I guess I'll ask a question. Do we know what the cost of uh, living for this year is? Did we ever do a cost of living increase overall? Um, not that I've not that I've looked into. Because I would be looking at what the cost of living, and I'd be more in favor of a 0.9 rather than a 1.9. And with that meaning said, that we have saved money from last year, and we've been moving forward, because people are going to go through economic stuff, and even though it's small numbers, it makes them feel more comfortable that we've we returned something held the line. So I'd be in favor of a lower number than what I'm seeing right now. We do, so when we had the budget workshop, we did talk about the difference between the CPI and the MPI. Mm -hmm. The MPI being the costs that municipalities incur and that it is different than CPI. Right. Um, and we showed in the chart there that it's, it's meeting and getting to the standard of where over the last four years, meeting that same amount that that MPI meets and that reaches. Um, I had one other thing and I've forgotten it. No, that's right. I have another Council. question on the cemetery. Councilor Wilkinson. Oh, you too, Chair. I've got a whole bunch of questions here, more or less on personnel. And like uh, on page six, it's under corporate services. The personnel is 766,000 and it's going to 906. Why would that be? Uh, we ended up reallocating um, different amounts to different areas. Um, no, I, if I may, can I answer that? Oh, okay. We, we did cover this uh, in a previous meeting. Uh, communications has moved into corporate services, and I think IT has moved into corporate services. All right, but on personnel, even if it moves around on engineering services, then for personnel, it's gone from 307 to 425. And um, on uh, roads, whatever that would be for personnel, that's up from 840 to 923. So even if we've reallocated people, like, I just don't know, it would work out somewhere, you think on parks and facilities, it's up from 873,000 to 1,085,000. So all of them are up. Like there's nothing down that you're allocating from one to another. But we're also, if I may, Madam Chair, mm. we're also going from a 0 0.9 schedule to a full 1.0. Okay, and that may right? be the So that's for part it. of it. And then, okay. of course, we have the union agreement, which I think is 2.25. 2.25 2. this year. Four percent. So, um, so there's that. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, no, I just thought if it was the reallocation, there's nothing going down, but I haven't thought about it. It is, it is actually it mostly due to the reallocations, and if you'll see, there's a number of them that went down, you know, so in, in you know, waste management and row, uh, uh, water and sewer, those all went down substantially. Um, they're, they're, most of the changes in the personnel items were um, in, in relation to this reallocation. Um, we didn't, I bring those specific numbers here, but um, for the union, for example, the change was only in that cost of, or sorry, the um, negotiated amount 2.25, uh, or we're not adding any staff um, uh, to that. And I don't remember the specific amount for, for manage as well, but we're not adding any additional management positions um, in this proposed budget. 
I would just like to see any excess go to roads rather than personnel. And I do believe um, during the budget workshop, did we not have it out in the percentage to personnel that was there? There was that exact amount and it was actually quite low um, in the overall budget. So in our budget yeah, workshop, that, whole, that was the, budget yeah, the whole personnel was not actually that high when it showed the personnel percentage increase as the whole. Do I, you, do you have that number? Yeah, I'm just pulling it up Thank here. You. Okay. Um, so the overall change uh, to salaries and benefits uh, was a hundred and ninety five thousand um, and then the wages and benefits uh, was eighty three thousand nine hundred and fifty so the total uh, the total between the two were two hundred and seventy nine thousand six hundred and sixty and that was three point one two percent and that is uh, that is going from I think that includes going from a zero point nine to a one point zero. It doesn't because we no, compare okay. that to the oh, original okay. budget from twenty twenty. Okay. 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 Yeah. Oh, and sorry, we also have we do have a new position, but that's paid for by a grant yeah. uh, for uh, the environmental. Manager. So there's a portion of that which and is that a full time that. position. That's yeah. right. But that's not coming from tax funds. That's coming from a grant. And that was in that money. Yeah, that that's right. Right. yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Councillor Sorensen? Um, through the chair to administration, I really like how water and sewer is laid out so you can tell more or less if it's um, if the utilities collected are covering the expenses. I'm wondering, I'm hoping maybe next year we can do a similar kind of table for stormwater now that it's under the utilities area. And we can see how close we're getting to uh, meeting our needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ochnet. That that certainly is our eventual goal. Of Stonewater is to treat it as a utility. It will take a few years for us to um, <clears throat> properly extract and track both costs and revenues associated with it. Um, but I I think within a, a few years you'll see it um, reported as almost identical to uh, water and sewer in terms of how it uh, presents here. Here. All right, there's a few things, a few concerns that I have uh, through to administration. Um, I, and I'll restate this again, um, I have a concern that we're not setting any money aside in our airport budget. Um, we will have future capital costs that are going to be significant over there. Um, I really would like to see that budget stabilize and put any excess into a reserve for the airport. Um, the second item, can I just run through my items? Okay, uh, the second item is, um, as we discussed uh, during the budget uh, workshop and uh, the subsequent meeting, uh, I'm very concerned that we're not doing enough in preventative maintenance for our road network. Uh, we don't do crack sealing, we're not uh, dealing with that, uh, and uh, it's only gonna cost us more on the capital side in the future. So I certainly wanna see an increase to a roads budget to deal with that. If we don't have the staff to do it, then we should be contracting that out. Um, and I think we need to build that into our budget. Um, and then a question on planning and development. Is there any money set aside to promote the new bike park or shop local campaign in 2021? Um, I think both of those are critical. Um, we, have, uh, we have some assets here that we should be uh, trying to promote. I don't know if you guys can answer that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I will maybe comment on the on the last one um, there specifically. Um, so uh, the promotion of the bikes park is um, planned to work mostly with the community development and parks group as we kind of see it as a, a parks asset. Uh, but I know that they are planning on working closely with the cycling association and trying to promote that asset uh, both locally but also um, in a regional sense as, as much as possible. So obviously a wonderful, new, exciting um, element of our community, and we hope to um, get as many people out there, both uh, those that live locally as well as um, those who may choose to visit Edson to take advantage of, uh, of that as well. Um, and we'll continue to work uh, through our development um, team uh, with the local chamber, community futures, um, and other um, services as we have in the past to support and, and work on a variety of initiatives that uh, we feel support the local economy. Um, we don't 
we have not at this point specifically um, designed or articulated it as a shop local campaign, um, just that we do have an ongoing and continuing commitment to work with those groups um, to engage the local uh, economy. Do one answers for your other questions? Uh, yeah, through to administration, do you have any yeah, uh, I, I think comments that, on the um, I would just say, I, I mean, if that's really a question for your colleagues at the table rather than administration, we will put as much money into the roads budget as council roads. tells us to um, put it put in there uh, and certainly open to council's um, prerogative or feedback on how they may wish to adjust, um, you know, things of that nature is the purpose of this uh, conversation. Councillor Sorensen? Um, I, uh, through the chair to council, I agree with uh, the mayor's comments mm -hmm. there. And I would point out that the citizen budget asked for a reduction in community development and parks. Although in our, in our budget here, we have a 10% increase in funding for those areas. Um, I would argue that we should consider uh, taking some funds from that department and maybe beefing up the roads and uh, preventative maintenance. Thank you. Councillor Schneider? Glad you guys brought up roads because that was one of my other questions. Um, I guess my question is, is we have not spent in the last time a lot of money on roads to un unforeseen. So once again, I'll bring up the thing with this um, and the questions. Why don't we pass an intern and we'll do a final one moving into the year coming. So uh, in December, we pass an interim budget, and I totally agree with the comments about the roads. Let's investigate into it. We have not spent a lot of money, and if we don't spend money on roads, it's going to cost us a fortune in the future. So, CEO Delco. Thank you. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Schnard, please, Councillor Schnard, if you could help me a little bit understand how that would help us at all better address our roads. Um, don't mind answering. Uh, then we can look back into the budget because right now I think we're doing about 1.1 and we average 2.3. So I'm looking at maybe we got to investigate into three or four million dollars to spend on roads, and that will totally change our whole budget. Like uh, dipping in some of our savings where we we put aside, and it's very important that if we don't fix the roads, it costs us double money. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, Councillor. It sounds to me like you're referring more to the capital portion. Of yes, the budget. I, just because we're talking about, but that is more capital, exactly right. Thank you. Mayor Sayer. Um, So, my recommendation um, there's, there's a couple things. I think that uh, we're, we have, uh, we're spending actually. Uh, over three million dollars on roads each year uh, from operational and capital 1.2 million on capital um, if we are looking at uh, the operational piece uh, I would task administration to, to look at where we would be able to find say a hundred thousand dollars of whatever the transportation department needs uh, to, to do that to crack ceiling and preventative maintenance piece uh, furthermore um, you know, if we are, are looking at uh, doing something there uh, for this year, we could look at accessing the uh, the tax stabilization reserve and depleting that since we're not we're planning on not utilizing that reserve in the, in the future. Um, and then when you're looking on the capital side, uh, as we found out today, we're getting an additional uh, 500 some thousand dollars for our wastewater treatment plant, which I'm very thankful for. Um, and I think that we should be looking to utilize that funding to beef up our capital plan for roads next year um, and taking advantage of uh, a slower economic time um, and maybe beefing that up to a $1.7 uh, uh, million dollar, um, capital plan or a $2 million capital plan uh, for 2021. Uh, because we have a lot of issues on a road network right now. Um, a lot of that has to do with the wet conditions that we had over the last two years. And uh, while we have crews here, I think we should try to um, address that as much as we can uh, next year. Um, and the other piece uh, for consideration would be, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Passy, uh, with the most grants in 2024, that's the unallocated portion. The last little bit, that'd be about 157. Yeah, so uh, 
in my view, I would like to use that hundred and fifty fifty some thousand dollars on the front end uh, for twenty twenty one to lessen the impacts on our residents and totally utilize that grant for 21, 22, and 23. We still have the COVID-19 response reserve in which we can address any other issues that may come forward in 2021. Councillor Byer. Uh, through the chair to council and administration, um, I, I echo um, the mayor's initial comments about the roads. I, I think that we definitely need to um, consider any preventative maintenance on it, right? We know that, you know, we, we've learned over the past few years through our asset management plan that the preventative maintenance is key. And although it's hard to wrap our heads around with getting all those preventative maintenance pieces in place, um, I, I think with our, the, the moisture level that we've had in the ground the past few years, as well as um, although the winter has been warm, I'm sure the, the frost or the freeze thaw cycles are not uh, beneficial at all to the cracks that are currently there and, and just amplifying the problem. Um, you know, even though we haven't had to have snow removal, um, I, I, I'd be in favor of having administration look to see if there's other other ways that they can increase the, the road budget. Um, and I'm, I'm fine with taking the money off the, the back end of the, the most grant and using it now, that 150 some thousand um, as well. Um, okay, question to the mayor, your idea there. Um, I'm in support of increasing to the road network, um, but if you're asking that this become a regular operating, because we are talking operating right now, I'm not in support of that coming out of the reserve. Um, because that just, then, the, then if we're wanting this to be a regular operation issue or operation budget, then that needs to be something that we have reallocated within the budget, whether that means increasing tax or we're taking it from somewhere else, um, or is this a, we're wanting to do this for this year? Because if we're looking at an operating, I don't think there's any point in us pushing that off if we're going to make a change and cut from somewhere else. Um, if Unless we're wanting this to be a year that we're saying we're catching up. Mm -hmm. uh, through uh, to Councilor Curry, I think this needs to be a regular operational item. And I agree that we shouldn't be. If it's going to be regular operation, uh, we need to build it into our budget. Maybe that, maybe that's for next year. Um, use, a, use a reserve this year, but build that in for next year. Uh, but I would be happy to hear what administration had to come back with in terms of where we might be able to find those funds. Um, I, I do think we've heard in our citizens budget tool results that people would be okay with a little bit less in parks. Um, so how can we how how can we do that? Um, you know we're, we're facing lots of pressures here, um, but uh, I'm very concerned that uh, we're falling further and further behind on our roads budget, and it it's actually bothersome to me that we're not. You know, I look at 63rd Street, new pavement there. We're not doing crack sealing or preventative maintenance. What that, we don't do that, uh, what that could look like in five to 10 years from now. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? It does answer my question. Um, anyone else? Councillor Sorensen? Um, thank you. Uh, through the chair to administration, um, I, m I just mentioned it. I didn't hear a lot of comment from council, so I'll ask administration. Parks and facilities is up 18% in budget. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't see anything here. Maybe I'm, I just, I've forgotten why it's going up that much. Thank you. Um, I, I think Councillor Sorensen, as you'll look there, that the biggest change there is the reallocation of the wages. Um, and so it's not a direct increase in service cost or, or um, outcomes there. Um, this also includes uh, a change that we're moving towards um, the building maintenance function of the organization being consolidated as, as its own business unit, um, which also um, is under the parks uh, and facilities portfolio. Uh, and so uh, some of those, most of those resources were taken from other places in the budget and placed into this. So it will show as an increase under the parks budget, but it's actually not an increase to the overall budget. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would be I would be in support for the road network if we were to pull some this year um, from a reserve. I don't know that I would be comfortable with pulling, you know, a full hundred thousand dollars from the reserve. That's a lot that we have to find. Uh, that's a tax percentage there that we have to find next year if we're going to maintain that. Um, I think I'd be in support of saying 50,000 from reserve, but then I'd want to see 50,000 from 
um, somewhere else. So you have Perhaps may I, I, I can make a suggestion, excuse me, for council's consideration. Um, it, it seemed to be that there was some general support for the idea of moving, um, you know, that uh, $157,000 from the back end of the most grant to the front end of the grant. Um, if you will allow us, we can take that away and just look like how that would play out over the um, over the three years. Um, and I don't think it would maybe be $100,000, but it may be close to that. Um, it would give us some flexibility to add that amount um, to the road budget. And then by the end of that process, that would then just have uh, become a normal operational item um, as part of that kind of general use of the most um, grant as it's proposed there. Anyone else? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, through to administration. Uh, we also talked about um, how we are going to um, show the utilization of grants to offset uh, the tax impact this year. Has administration uh, have any thoughts on how we're going to do that? Instead, like what we did last year, where people didn't realize that for taxes that were actually supposed to be a certain amount, but we actually um, used reserve funds to buffer it, uh, being a little bit more transparent about that process as a rebate or something of, of that effect. Um, thank you. I'll just maybe briefly comment. I don't know if Mike or Sarah will have anything to add to that. Um, uh, we haven't, uh, I think, prepared what we felt would be a fulsome report on, on that or, or how we can do that. Um, but uh, administration is very supportive of um, including uh, and, and, and ensuring people see and understand um, all the various um, revenue areas that we consider um, when we build the budget. Um, so we have some obviously some very general information, you know, the pie charts saying this much taxation, this much user fees and, and grants are um, obviously an important part of that. Um, but we can absolutely work to um, uh, make that clearer um, and you know, obviously communicate that so people can see um, that, that there's obviously a lot of um, effort being made uh, as well as success in um, supporting some of the service levels through some of those other funding opportunities. I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to add to that. But. No, um, not much. Just I'm sure we could create a report saying, you know, what ways, what things are being used to, to, to bring that taxation number down that's, so it doesn't affect people um, and, 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 and just have some overall idea of what's being used, if these weren't being used, what would the taxes be, and have some kind of infographic that goes out about that. Where's there? Well, thank you. I was just, uh, through the administration, I was talking more about the tax notices themselves, mm -hmm. showing that on the individual tax notices that, you know, your taxes are actually this, but because we're using the most grants, we're using all these other things, mm -hmm. uh, you're only actually paying this on the municipal portion. Uh, because a lot of effort and time has gone into that to try to help our taxpayers last year. And I don't think um, we necessarily, I don't know if the public necessarily understood that. Um, and uh, it's going to, and that way it makes it a little bit easier when we're, we're flexing back into our regular numbers here in two, three, four years. You'll see that amount becoming less and less. It's not like, oh my God, my taxes went up 20%, which is actually not the case. Thank you. I, I, I thank you for clarifying that, Mayor. Um, that certainly helps. Yes, we can absolutely um, include that as part of our communication effort. Uh, you know, at the time of the tax notices going out, and I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilor Sorensen. Uh, through the chair to administration, uh, can you clarify if um, any um, renovations are included to chamber? Um, I. Personally, I believe we should try to get the public back into this room as soon as possible, and I think we should be using most grants and COVID-related grants for that kind of uh, renovation, so I would like to see it sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, through the Chair, uh, the, this bu budget does not contemplate a large expenditure for um, a, a renovation. It is um, administration's intent to um, in, investigate a little further to see what those costs may be and what our options are and then to present that to council at a future date for consideration um, at which point I think those funding options would remain available um, to us um, but uh, is certainly on our um, uh, list of priorities uh, as per direction from council 
um, that addressing some of the um, functionality limitations of this space would be um, something that this council would like to see more information on. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Do you have what you need from us, Mr. Fassi? Uh, I was just saying, um, so, so uh, I'll just try to kind of clarify that. Um, uh, what I would, what we would bring back based on this conversation is the budget as presented with um, a, an adjustment of the most grant by moving some of that money forward and, and, and in, um, adding that to the roads maintenance budget to see some additional work there. Um, that, that's really the only direction I think we've received, um, which is great. We're satisfied with that. I just want to make sure that's the, um, that council would be prepared to support that budget um, if it was brought forward in that manner next Tuesday, which means you would be voting to support um, the 1.9% tax increase, acknowledging that um, the portion of that is just an offset from the $70,000 um, that will be moved to the utility fee for stormwater management. So in essence, it's a 2.5% taxation increase. Um, and if once this council is prepared to support that, we would be very happy to bring that back. So I just wanna, before we leave that, I just wanna make sure that council was we shouldn't leave this order uh, item until council is um, sure. prepared to support that. Yeah. So the chair, I just like to thank you very much for considering putting more into the roads because I couldn't have supported it prior to that. I'm very willing to support your changes. Yeah, as really council's changes, and as I said, it's really council's prerogative. Right, we're, but you're going to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're obviously happy to implement those as, as yeah, directed and, and uh, understand that that's a priority for council. Where's Sarah? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, to administration, um, uh, Mr. Derricott, Mr. Passy, uh, Ms. Bittner, uh, and the rest of the team. Thank you for your work on this. I know a lot of time and effort uh, goes into this. Um, uh, behind the scenes using spreadsheets and <laughs> software to actually do it, I was uh, quite surprised by that. Uh, I guess the one item I don't think we had a really good discussion on was on the capital uh, work for roads next year. Uh, Sorry, I apologize. I'm, I'm speaking more for the just, operation of yeah. and then we will also address the capital oh. budget before we move on as well. Okay, do you want to talk about that now? or I, I would prefer for us to kind of close the loop on the operational budget okay. and we'll, we'll just okay. touch the capital. But I apologize, okay. Mayor, okay. jumping in there. Councilor Bayer? Uh, thanks uh, through the chair to council. Um, uh, Mayor Zahara mentioned something that we've talked about in the past, and that's the uh, the airport and finding um, finding space for uh, creating a reserve for um, some future development. We know that runways are extremely expensive, and uh, buildings are expensive, and everything around airports seem to be quite expensive. Um, I don't know if administration has a way to to start something small that we can. Um, earmark as a, as a reserve for that, or, or is that better having that under a regular infrastructure reserve? I don't know what in administration's recommendation would be for that. Thank you, through the chair. Um, uh, at this point, the, at this stage of the budget, I would just suggest that any addition of that nature would just be a taxation item. Mm -hmm. um, and we're and that's at the um, discretion of uh, council. Um, administration is certainly of the same mind that we want to build in our long-term um, sustainability to as many of our programs as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. I think this council has been supportive of that and, and has shown commitment to that um, as uh, I think administration operates under those same principles. I would just say, um, I just think we're, um, we can only accomplish so much in any given year. Um, and uh, I really do feel like we've made some great progress in our general uh, approach to financial sustainability. Um, that just may be for another year, I guess, is ultimately what I'm saying um, uh, for consideration of, of council. Uh, unless, of course, you're comfortable adding that number two taxation. So everybody is in Mayor Sarah. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I I agree uh, uh, to CEO Derek and I think maybe we need to have a more fulsome discussion strategically about the airport and what we want to do. I think if I if I really uh, think about it, I I really think that that should be a user fee type component that's going into that reserve or a 50-50 split, not 100% taxation. So uh, I'd be supportive of maybe having a more or to discussion about that next year. Yeah. Councilor Sorensen. Through the chair to council, I know uh, administration is preparing a, a 
policy or guidelines on reserves. And so that would be probably a good time to discuss it as well at the same time. Um, if I may have one other comment, please. Yes. The chair. Um, is there any possible way to get back on this, my parks issue, uh, to put an asterisk on this public document that says staff were moved around into this department and that's why there's an 18% increase in it in this department? Thank you through uh, through the chair to Councillor Sorensen. We can absolutely take a look on that at that and and, and where those adjustments uh, present as a substantial change, we can identify that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Schneider. Not at the right timing. We moved on to capital. No, no, we're not. Okay. No. <laughs> then I'll wait. <laughs> we're moving on to capital. No. Carry on. I am in support, um, but I, I still have concerns about us putting a hundred, like adding a hundred thousand dollars into our operating that is directly from grants. So I do, I do that. I do think that there's, you know, we are, we are just prolonging. Um, if that's a decision that we're making, that we're putting a hundred thousand dollars into roads, uh, which I agree with, but we are just, and I, and I agree with it for the season and what is happening in the world right now. Um, but I, I do think financially it's a little off of what we've usually typically gone by. Um, we don't typically put things off because we know how that goes for us in the future. Um, so I do think that it is it is definitely um, something that has been doing done because of the pandemic, but I don't think it's smart uh, financially on us to put $100,000 into an operating that is not coming out of somewhere else. So I'll just, but I will support it. Anyone? Now do you have enough? I, I've only personally haven't heard whether or not, I mean, Councilor Curry has indicated you'll support it, but yeah. I haven't heard anyone Sorry, else. Sorry, let's go around. Mm -hmm. Council yes. Yes. Council so we're moving to 150,000, I support it. Nice yes. I also want to say this obviously does not preclude Council from further deliberation discussion at that point in time. Mm -hmm. It just guides us that, mm -hmm. that we can move forward with that direction. Uh, thank you so much for um, taking a moment to clarify that for us. Um, Councillor Chouinard, if I may through the chair now, we will move on to discuss <laughs> yes, I, We are going to move on to <laughs> corporate services, financial and capital plans. Um, no, sorry, no, the capital budget. budget. Sorry, we'll budget. To that. No, 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 sorry. Budget. Budget. Questions or concerns about the capital budget that's presented here. Okay, so it is in the same agenda. I am sorry, you were correct. Mayor Sayer. Uh, so as I indicated, um, we just found out this morning, so it's not a part of this, uh, that we are going to be receiving uh, some funds that we didn't expect, uh, 500, uh, I think it was 80 some thousand dollars from Alberta Transportation for the cost overruns over the wastewater treatment plant, uh, which originally came out of our infrastructure reserve. Um, and so I think, I really think we need to be aggressive next year on uh, some of our capital paving. Um, I know there's lots to be addressed. I know that uh, the general manager of uh, uh, of our infrastructure department, uh, Mr. Ham, would love some extra money, I'm sure, um, to do a little bit more aggressive work there. So I would be in support of uh, moving, um, including that number into uh, our capital plan for transportation for next year. Um, and also uh, considering moving an operational reserve into capital, that tax stabilization fund, which I believe we are not um, going to be using in the future anymore uh, to also bolster uh, our capital plan for transportation next year. That's just my thoughts. Right, so Thank you. Um, uh, so um, certainly um, the discretion of council on the first part of that. The second part of that, I just want to offer some clarification to the tax stabilization fund. Um, we we recommend that you leave the tax stabilization fund available. Um, the purpose of that is is that if we ever did run into a deficit, the um, that that um, would be there to um, offset uh, a deficit position. Um, all we did was take that from the friend, front end and propose it, that it be there for the back end. Okay. Um, whereas in past years, we would have actively budgeted several hundred thousand dollars from the tax stabilization fund um, to uh, 
uh, I don't want to say balance the budget, but I guess in effect, that's what it would be doing. Uh, we've removed that, um, but that tax stabilization fund just becomes now important on the back end. Um, that if we did have a tough year or unexpected expenses, and, and et cetera, that that's what we would draw on in any given year to prevent um, you know, uh, further impacts to the municipality. Um, so I, I, I don't, the administration doesn't support your recommendation there. Maybe that clarification will change your um, thoughts on that. Um, I think that will obviously be part of what we also uh, address in the reserve policy where it's identified what we feel a healthy amount is and an appropriate amount to have in that kind of fund um, to give a little better clarity um, on that as well. I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to add. No, it's the same, same thing. It's just it's that, that tax stabilization fund, instead of rather being part of, a, of the budget um, and, and that we're using, it would be a backstop in case there is a deficit to, to then um, remedy that, but it would not be we have removed it from the budget as a line item that is funding the budget. Councilor Swanson. Uh, through the chair to the council, um, I, I believe that the um, five hundred eighty thousand uh, would call it grant or refund or it's yeah so thank, thank you it's, it, it is technically a grant um, okay. that was owed to the municipality as part of a commitment through the wastewater treatment plant project it is now completely unencumbered as in council can direct those fundings uh, that funding wherever they see uh, fit so i i believe that should be put into a waste water operating reserve or capital reserve or be used to reduce the um, utility um, so the word, the utility fee charged for wastewater. Um, to be open and transparent, I believe that's what we should be doing. Thank you. That's for sure. I, like to, I have to agree with, let me have my here. I have to agree with the mayor's comment that's exactly what my thought was, is the road rehab when we originally, we took $2 million out of our capital money to go there and now it's being returned. I'd like to see 2 million, but we got 580,000. And since we took out two, if we could find another 400, so instead of paying 1.2 million, we could spend 2.2 million because we did take 2 million out. It wasn't a bad move. Now we got 580. It should go back where it came from and fix the roads because we have certain roads in town that we've talked about for years and we need to do something. So I would be more aggressive. And I think like the mayor commented, our tax stabilization, what is that at? Four or 500,000 right now? How much do we have in reserve? Uh, about two hundred. Two hundred by in the um in the reserve. Two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Okay, because then just follow from that where we had the COVID savings last year. So if we can even get close to the million, I'd be in favor of that. The five eighty and plus the two hundred, because at the end of the day, I understand where we're saving it, but if we don't spend the money and the roads fall apart, it's gonna cost us double. So it wouldn't be a bad move of taking money we put for a cushion to look after our infrastructure, meaning our, our roads. It'd be a very smart move. So that was my comment on capital, and now it's my turn to talk. Councilor Byer. Uh, through the chair to uh, council and administration, um, I, I don't think I would be in favor of um, uh, including that 500 or yeah, 587,000, uh, the money that we just received from the grant, uh, putting that back into the wastewater treatment plant because we've already allocated an additional two million to the wastewater treatment plant outside of that so this is now even more money um, on top of that um, i would be interested though um, I, I don't believe this is money that we have to allocate tonight um, if that's my understanding if we just heard about it um, uh, thank you yeah no it's it's absolutely not money that has to be allocated to, to tonight it certainly is fine to <laughs> to um, make that determination uh, but it's not necessary okay um, if I may continue, um, I, I would be interested in hearing um, uh, what administration would uh, prefer to, uh, what you would suggest, uh, recommend uh, putting that money towards, um, especially if it includes anything within our asset management plan. So um, I, I don't know where our biggest deficit is um, after this budget would be uh, passed. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing um, where where it would be best allocated from your perspective. Council Wilkinson. To the chair, I'd just like to echo what Councillor Byer said about we've already paid the $2 million into the wastewater treatment plant. It's finished. It's done. Now this is found money, actually, that we can allocate wherever we want, and I don't think we need to put it back into that to save taxpayer money. Mayor Sarah? 
Uh, thank you uh, through to administration. Um, thanks for the explanation on the stack tax stabilization fund. I retract my idea on, on that, but um, this, the original uh, extra 2 million for the wastewater treatment plant came out of the infrastructure reserve, which stopped some road projects from occurring uh, in that year because we no longer had that money. And uh, I feel very strongly that uh, we need to tackle some of that next year. Um, so, um, but I, I do uh, agree with uh, Councillor Byer's point, uh, how that looks like in the asset management plan. If there's something that is a little bit more priority, uh, I certainly would be willing to consider that, but I think we have some serious work that we need to do on road infrastructure over the next few years. <clears throat> Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not prepared to comment on in detail at, the, at this moment, but I would support the um, administration supports the perspective of the mayor to share. As far as we're concerned, that money uh, came from the infrastructure reserve, and it makes sense to us that that money be, would be returned to the infrastructure reserve. The infrastructure reserve right now is quite a broad mandate, um, and so uh, it, it's been really to rehabilitate or, or um, invest in any of the infrastructure, water, sewer, roads, um, et cetera, that the town is responsible for. Uh, and so among those, um, uh, investing into our road system certainly would be applicable uh, and appropriate, uh, I think, use of those, use of those funds. Um, it does not have to be decided tonight, um, and, and even um, if council is comfortable, uh, we could just take that away uh, and, and come back uh, maybe early in the new year uh, with a recommendation on where we can best leverage that money um, uh, you know, with the context of our asset managed plan, et cetera. I won't be surprised at all if it is roads, <laughs> um, but um, that'll just give us a chance to chew on that a little bit and make sure we make a, a thoughtful recommendation. Thank you. Um, I, I also would not be in support of the tax stabilization fund being used uh, in that way. I think especially with decisions we've kind of made and are operating, um, I don't think that's something we should be touching right now. Um, as far as that grant, I, I would like to see it definitely 100% in infra infrastructure. I would like it to be hopefully probably spent next year knowing what um, costs are right now. Um, but I wouldn't be comfortable saying that it's going directly into anything right now tonight without knowing and knowing how that money was exactly being spent. Um, typically, we kind of have a asset management with all of our capital, so I would want to see that ahead of time. Thank you. Else? I think the mayor is first. He was first. Mayor Sahara. I'm sorry, I've been recording all the time here tonight. Uh, through the chair, through the administration, during our uh, joint meeting with Yellow County, they did have some concerns over um dust control on uh on what evening that is 26th. 26th um towards the county Excuse industrial me. park um is that is have we included any funds to deal with that for next year as a part of our uh plan i think that's something small that we can do to uh, address one of the concerns that county had thank you through the uh, through chair certainly th there's not anything uh, i think directly reflected um, in either the capital or operational budget, but I don't think there's anything that precludes us from considering that request and working with them to see if we can't address that. That's a sure. Just a clarification then, for passing the budget next Tuesday, is this capital plan part of that budget or not? Yes. Okay, well then, then when I'm hearing in the room, we're not comfortable moving it now because we shouldn't talk about it, but we should be talking about it because it's gonna be part of the budget. We're passing next Tuesday. We should allocate it tonight. No, that we're not talking about that five hundred thousand dollars that was just found out about, That's and correct. we're not adding in a project without knowing what it is. So that project can still be brought to us. That money is there, mm -hmm. and that can be brought to us in January when we have the proper information to make an okay, educated well, choice. Just clarification, though, for for pushing to pass the budget, we should be talking about it because now is our last chance to discuss the budget. But we can't here. discuss that without. Uh, like our admin team has to bring back the project with the proper information, with the proper budget of how we would actually be spending it. So and if we can actually spend it even in that year. Okay. I think you just to add to that, if I may, through that. the chair. Um, yeah, so administration is certainly asking today for an endorsement of the capital budget that's in front of you. Um, certainly we've heard loud and clear that council supports a project plan for allocation of that 580 thousand dollars, which we'll be very happy to provide um, with a little bit of time to review. Uh, for tonight and for next week, we're suggesting that this capital budget that's in front of you would be what council would adopt. 
females. Do you have what you need from us? Do you want me to go around? I mean, that, that's at your discretion. I, I heard general support for this um, budget here, <coughs> and, and so I'm comfortable, Mike. Um, yep, Councilor Fire. Uh, through the chair to administration, uh, just on the capital budget, uh, the, the items that are currently listed there, um, I know we have some that are in italics um, that uh, are run from, carried over from 2020. Um, how, how do we expect, uh, it, has there been any change with um, the expectation of, of when they would be completed or, or tendering processes? COVID made any changes with um, the current environment? Thank you. Uh, so for a number of those items, we remain um, in a holding pattern in relation to regulatory uh, approvals, uh, and we have no indication at this stage when um, some of those approvals may come. So unfortunately for, I think, a handful of, of those, um, we're not in a position to give any more of a detailed update. Um, for others, it's it, obviously a, a number or combination of factors. Um, have uh, contributed to uh, timing and, and other pieces. Um, we don't have any reason to believe, uh, assuming regulatory approvals, that these projects wouldn't be completed in a timely manner. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. All right, moving on to the financial and capital plans. <coughs> Still me here. Still me. <laughs> <laughs> So as part of the MGA requirements to pass a three-year operational financial plan and a five-year capital plan, we are presenting that at this time. Um, this is based on the 2021 budget that we presented, um, and then um, and then the years going out. So first, there is the capital plan, um, and it's broken down as a, where they've got a summary first, and then it has the projects broken down by year and where they where they fit in and. Um, and then following that is the operational plan, um, which is the current year or the 2021 budget plus three years. Um, and that's just, we've, the capital plan is pretty close, if not the same as to what you would have seen at the strategic planning uh, session. Um, the operational one is is when we are still um, working at fine tuning it. It's, it's fluctuating a bit as we get better idea of what's coming in the years to come and the next few years and it's, constantly fluctuating to see what's what comes next. Um, oh, and this is one of the other thing that we would be looking at. It has to be passed once a year, and we'd be looking at changing the timing of passing this more towards the spring or, or early summer um, following strategic planning to have that more in line with that timing. And then it just be, it's just passed each year, and then we would then focus on the budget and be able to have that inform um, the budget preparations. Questions? No. It is fairly straightforward, I think. Uh, well, I, I was expecting the mayor to pop in here. Oh, um, Councillor Schneider. I believe it's straightforward. We can pass it. Oh, wow. Well, you wanted to comment on <laughs> either one. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Oh, Councillor Sorensen. <laughs> I'm looking at the three year operational plan, and I'm unclear. Is that next year? Is that a surplus or a deficit of 600,000? That would that's indicating um, there would be $660,000 more required in taxation. So we fine tune that before it's brought forward. So that's a six, yeah, seven, all oh, seven percent increase in taxes. Mm -hmm. next year. So that, that's one of the things it's 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 a plan, it's not a budget. Um, it's to it will it will be fine tuned to be something that is more acceptable and, and what council council would like to see go brought forward and, and pass at that time. Um, again, it's one of these processes that it's it's new to our organization. We are working at, at getting it better, and we're hoping to see that improve uh, year after year. Thank you. If I would just add to that. Uh, um, the, 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 the planning, operational planning process is more influenced by service pressures and trends and is not, you know, a directly financial instrument as the budget is. And I think that's partly what Mike was communicating there. Um, and certainly um, we, we don't intend nor should council expect that that would be perfectly reflected in any given year's budget. It's just a process by which we can start to look forward and forecast 
um, in particular costs that are known, you know, changing personnel costs, um, and trends in you know, energy costs and other things that do have a, a large impact on our budget. Uh, and then it helps us to better prepare for um, pressures that we may see uh, down the road. So uh, I think the way it's shown is very, very intentional, which is um, based on those general trends that we're applying here, we know we've got some work to do um, to probably get that in line with what we feel is an appropriate um, budget number um, when we get to that space. Anything else? Okay, thank you, Mr. Cassidy. So bring those both items back in mostly the same shape, but with some other adjustments, especially to the, the roads budget to, at the next council meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving on so to un tax sale viewers too. That's Sarah. Okay. Until <laughs> tax sale properties, Ms. Bittner. Is like, I thought he was ejecting a little services. early there. Yeah. <laughs> I beg all the hard stuff. <sighs> You're fitting into your new role, coming up perfectly. <laughs> <Delegate. laughs> yeah. Delegating appropriately. All right, good evening, Council. Uh, if you remember back in uh, September, we held an auction to sell the, um, the uh, tax properties that uh, were in arrears. Uh, we started with a long list. You know, on the day, we ended up with two properties. Um, we had no one come to the auction and uh, receive no bids for these properties. So we now have to move on to the next stage as to what we as a municipality and you as a council decide you want to do with these properties. So there are three options that happen when properties don't sell um, at the tax sale auction. Um, so there's three options that, that we can look at. Option one, um, which is, 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 council's, is administration's recommendation to council, to at least do this option. Um, you do what's called a tax forfeiture title, where we don't purchase the properties, but we do. Uh, we can register our name on the title, and it's registered on the title, even set as a tax forfeiture on the title. Um, by doing this, we can then, um, we have a little bit of control over that property. We can rent it out, we can license lease, or we can sell it um, at a price close to the market value, as we would have done it at, at auction. Um, if it doesn't sell after 15 years with this tax forfeiture on the title, um, we can then request the registrar to give us a clear title and then we own it outright. Right. Um, that, that, that is our recommendation as, 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 as administration for the, for the least um, to do. Uh, the next step from that is after you do get that tax forfeiture title, you can acquire clear title. But by doing that, you would need to deposit the amount equal to what our, our reserve bid was into a separate bank account. And then we can then get a clear title and own that property outright. Uh, but from those funds, they would pay our tax arrears. There's also some costs and expenses listed in the MGA that we would need to, to clear as well. And then we notify the owner that if, if there's money left over that um, they, they can uh, apply for that money. Uh, if we are can, if we are happy that we know all the debts are paid, we can give them that money. If we're not one hundred percent clear on that, they must apply to the Court of Queen's Bench to show us that there's nothing left on that, and then we can give them the funds. They get their money, we get the property, and it's all just clear. Um, third option is we do nothing, and the property taxes just continue to accrue. Uh, we can't sell, lease. We don't acquire it after 15 years, everything would just stay the same, except the taxes would keep piling on and it would keep going to tax sale year after year after year. Uh, so based on those three options, as I said, administration's recommendation is to at, at least do option one, get our name on that title, and then that gives us options in the future if we want to acquire that property by, by um, buying it or just by letting the, the 15 years go. Uh, the other part of that, though, is, is if within that 15 years, the original owner comes back and pays us those arrears, they can then get the title put back into their name. If we do option two and pay them the money, they, they, they lose that opportunity as well. Uh, so I just, yeah, um, just saw, put those uh, options, present them to council and uh, seek direction on how you feel we should proceed with these properties. Councilor Wilkinson. To the chair, I just have a question, and maybe it's simple, but how do we have tax owing on Ansel Tower Road and not a place in town under 
the Calendar Baths and they keep going through the chair to House Wilkinson. It's on the town side of Ansel Tower Road. Oh. Ansel Tower Road runs, and there's a town side and a county side. So it's a, on neighbor, the a neighbor of Council Yes, Council it's just Shredder. down from I Council know the Shredder. property well. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> yes. okay, okay, thank you. Sorry, I just forgot. Part of the county, okay. Thank you very much. The call is a conflict. Mm. Council Byer. Uh, through the chair to Council. So in the option one, uh, what, what happens to the current tenants or people that are residing at these locations? Um, what, what happens to them if they're, if they're, I don't know if they're still there or not, but um, if, they, if there are people there? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Byer, uh, if, if we had that tax forfeiture title, mm -hmm. we could then enter in an agreement with any current tenants if we wish to, for them to continue with their tenancy, they would just be tenants of ours at that point, mm -hmm. rather than of the original owner. We basically yeah. would assume control of the property. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. If we then wish to actually um, purchase that or sell it to someone else, well, I think we would have to follow, I'd have to look into that. I think we'd have to follow the same as with tenancy, give them notice, that type of thing, um, what it was sort of legally required by that, depending on how we wish to uh, proceed past just getting the name on the title. Okay. Uh, through to administration, uh, do you know if we've been in a situation before um, and what has been done in the past? And are we able to utilize the property ourselves? Uh, in particular, there's, there's one uh, property on Main Street. Um, as I know, we have talked about things like incubator programs for uh, economic development. Um, I guess, what would those options look like under what's going on here? Uh, that one building um, obviously has been vacant for quite some time now, so I'm not sure of the circumstance. But. Through the chair to Mia Zahara. Um, just sitting here and think for just one moment on this. I think if we, um, I think we would need to get clear title if we were going to, um, like we wouldn't be able to demolish it or anything like that unless we actually owned it. Maybe I misunderstood your question a little bit because you're looking I, at I think, I think it's, um, we, we can, we can, look, we can rent and lease the building. Um, I, I believe so yes. once, once we have on the tax forfeiture listed on title mm -hmm. and so using it for municipal purposes I believe becomes an option after that. Um, we would have to deal with any current tenants or any anything like that before we could. Uh, as far as if it's happened in the past we have had there was a little piece of property below the railway line that we um, someone else owned and for years and years it was just but then it's now in our name um, for us to, to, I don't think we did the option two, I think we just still have the option one, there's no road access to it, things like that. I believe that before my time, the land where Canadian Tire is now was, um, became ours through a tax forfeiture um, process. Uh, those amounts owing as taxes stay as owing on that roll number. Um, and they stayed there until such time as we actually sold that land to um, Canadian Tire. So that balance remained on the taxes for quite a number of years because we didn't move to option two. We just stayed in that option one um, past that. So, I'm just sort of shocked with the auction thing because in most cases they all come off. Did someone not have a lien on the property, a bank or something? Through the Chair to Council Chanel, we were in contact with both owners continually right up until the time um, of the auction. Um, <laughs> giving, no, them, giving, just... giving them all the options um, yeah. to go into, there's always options to go into a, a tax payment schedule, all those types of things. Um, there wasn't a, an appetite for that with either of these owners for this property. So just to be clear, now we own these two properties? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to sort out how to get the taxes. Through the Chair to Council. We don't own the property unless we move to option two. Um, at the moment, it's their property. Our name's not on the title. We haven't done anything with it. At all. We're just trying, yeah. So I'm just clarifying. Yeah. We got option one, two, and three. I just I'm shocked that it got to this stage, but yes. Yeah, so we have to choose mm -hmm. one of the options. Okay. Councillor Sorensen. Uh, through the chair to administration, you mentioned that in option three we can just do another auction next year. Can we just do another auction next month? Do we have to wait a whole year? Uh, through the the chair to. Uh, Councillor Sorensen, we can't just keep doing it next month. And actually, when I say next year, that's probably incorrect because you'd have to remove this notification on the title 
and then put it back on again. So it'll probably be another, it'll be like every two or three years we'll be able to put it up for auction again because you have to follow the process with, we've already had this one on, it didn't work, we have to take it off, put another one on to continue on with that. It's quite a process. <laughs> Councillor Sorensen? So if we went with auction one, could you put a for sale sign on it tomorrow? <coughs> yes, with auction one, just checking my notes. <laughs> yeah. With auction one, we can offer it for sale. Yes. Just the, um, just that the proceeds of the sale would go largely to the owner of the property. Mm -hmm. We would just recoup our, yes. yeah. our taxes and we can't sell it for less than a reasonable market price. Mm -hmm. Uh, through the chair to council and administration, I'm comfortable with option one. Through the chair, is this contaminated land where that Thai uh, company was that okay. made ties? Uh, no, no. I'm not sure. No, it's not. You know, when we were in the assessment review committee, it's not no, that it's not same that. land? No, I would just simply okay. say we, we, we don't have any reason to believe that it would be contaminated, contaminated in any mm. significant way. We don't have that, in, whether we have no report or no information to assure that. Uh, but as far as we know, uh, there's no major um, issues with the, with the land. It's just taking ownership of something sometimes isn't worth it. This is very true. If I may clarify just one other thing, we don't have to, we could go to option one and then go to option two at a later date. We don't have to decide to go directly to option two tonight, which is why we, we recommend one at least to at least get that on the table. I'm in support of option one. Option one. Mm -hmm. Option one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm in support of option one and I'm putting on for sale immediately. Okay. Okay. Roundtable, right. everyone in support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bittner. Is yours on one? Okay. Next one's yours. Right. Yeah. All right. Next up, we've got the Alberta Municipal Affairs Internship Program. Thank you through the chair. Uh, I, I won't spend too much time on this. I think we're all very familiar with this program at this stage. Uh, I'll just highlight um, uh, the recent great work um, we've received from an uh, organization from our current intern, um, Mandy Chan, on the electric vehicle charging network, among other projects she's been associated with, as well as the great work uh, Council's just reviewed tonight from another former intern, Mr. Passy, um, who has uh, become an important part of our organization. Uh, we continue to believe that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to add low-cost assets um, to our organization and to provide better and enhanced service in an effective way. Um, it does require a resolution and support for Council. Um, it is currently considered in the budget you just reviewed, so there's no additional budgetary impact should council choose to support this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dale. Mm -hmm. Councilor Brian. Uh, thanks. Uh, through the chair to administration, um, I'm in full support of this. Uh, I think through all of the interns that we've had since I've been on council, um, the um, contributions that they made have been really outstanding, and um, and I think something that they've all brought something to the table that's been unique, and that I think has kind of been shared with the rest of the organization. And um, I love that um, that it's a partial grant, so um, our local taxpayers don't have to pay for that increased service. Thank you. Councilor Sorensen. Uh, through the chair, I'm in full support of this. I love having the outside perspective on our organization, and I think it's a great program. Mayor's here. I'm in full support. We've uh, we've had a very strong program here, and Municipal Affairs has recognized that as well. So I think we need to continue, and I have no doubt that we'll be successful in the grant. Yeah, I will just uh, make sure Council uh, recognizes um, that it is um, just support of an application. We are not guaranteed at this stage. Um, we've obviously been quite successful, and we will be um, hopeful that that will continue. Um, but that is obviously uh, uh, needs to be approved uh, by municipal affairs. I also am in full support. Um, I echo what the other councillors have said. Um, I think we've seen the asset that they have brought to the organization. I think they have all brought a unique um, asset and I think I agree with Councillor Sorensen. I think it's really fortunate that we get to have an outside view coming in. Um, I think it really helps us. So I'm in full support. Thank you. Good to go. All right, moving on to 
infrastructure and planning. We've got billboards. Sure I'm going to declare a couple. All right. We have Julia Darling from our development office. Hey, I recognize our you. Officer yeah. Council. Is this your first? This is my first presentation. <laughs> well, and of course, course we're on Zoom, so now, now I have to figure out how to share my phone. Oh, that's it. Oh, thanks. Hey, I don't know what I'm doing. I usually do this kind of stuff on my phone. I just double click it. Okay, so tonight I'm here to continue our conversation on the land use bylaw. I just got to click the presentation button. It is deciding whether it's going to work for me. There we go. Um, we're just asking for your feedback and comments. Um, we've presented uh, a few other times on just different things in the land use bylaw. Um, so we'll get started. Um, just a brief outline. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on what I'm going to talk about, uh, how other, I'm going to explain how other municipalities are dealing with billboards, um, some alternative options to move forward with, and then you guys can fill me with your questions. So for background, our current land use bylaw, um, we have a five-year validity period on billboards. Um, prior to their expiration, we have a process that we follow for reissuing permits that ends up being quite cumbersome and takes quite a bit of time away from administration. Um, we've identified parts in this process that could be eliminated to, pro to provide more effective services um, to align with your strategic priorities. Um, these are the um, communities that I used for my research. Um, Hinton just did, redid their land use bylaw. White Quartz is quite nice and uh, Drayton Valley has also recently redone. Mind you, the billboard section, sorry, the billboard section isn't in their land use bylaw, it's in their signage bylaw. Um, but I've included in your agenda packages the excerpts out of those bylaws um, for your review if you wanted to look into it a little bit further. So in my research, um, the biggest difference uh, in the other municipalities' bylaws is there is no validity period. When a billboard is applied for, a permit is issued, and that's meant for the life of the billboard. There, of course, would be conditions placed on those permits that help us do our jobs. Um, but this does result in red tape reduction. Another key point found in other municipalities' bylaws um, is their use of simplistic language. Their points are very short and sweet and to the point. All of the bylaws were similar in the requirements of the development of a billboard, including the dimensions, setbacks, and where the municipality billboards can be located. Um, and then when comparing our land use bylaw to our neighbors, it was immediately noticed that a simplistic approach to billboards is what we as administration would recommend. Uh, moving forward, uh, administration is asking for your feedback on your preferred approach to issuing permits for billboards. And that is it. Questions? Well done. Thanks. Councilor um, Schnarr. Attached where we have uh, 103 point, or it's got 103 point billboard uh, item C. So I just need to and that's the one that no billboard should be located within the boundaries of South First Avenue and 54th. Um, in some cases, the reason I'm saying this, let's say that property comes up for sale or something, buildings down, would we allow them to put in a temporary billboard? Because it's saying on here it has specific areas if a person putting up uh, signs wanted to apply, and I'm just going to use for example, in one of those locations, a building is demolished and they want to put up a billboard saying this land is for sale or advertising something, would be would they be able to apply under special conditions to break this rule? I guess I'd have to put it simple. Uh, through the chair. Um, that would be a temporary billboard. So right. billboards that are meant for sale are part of our temporary um, signage bylaw. Okay, so so all, these are meant for permanent um, structures that have an engineered feature to them affixing them to the ground. Okay. 
then Council Schnur, I think just a reminder, we're not, um, right now we're just discussing it, how we want to change ours and not how for specifics. But that's actual. exactly what I'm discussing because this is C1 and how I'd like to change or want a clarification because that is changing. Well, we're not going into the details, right? Like that detail. Did you want that detail? If, or uh, just this? Do you sure. want if you want to be that detail, that's fine. We, we would have to bring you back a, a draft and mm -hmm. ultimately I'm looking for looking for just your style. direction on mm -hmm. style and if you want to make changes immediately or look at a land use bylaw rewrite or just open the conversation about our land use bylaw in general. The details we see in the Well, that is a detail as far as I see it. So if we don't want the kind of details, I won't, but that was one that was concerning to me. I looked at the other day. Councilor Wilkinson. To the chair. I'd like to see it remain with the five year on my last term in council. This was one of our major issues with signage and uh, yes. it really, it, it can be a problem. It's very unsightly in the town if things get left and you don't have any strength to get rid of them. So I prefer that, that we have some hammer. Um, I definitely prefer the simplistic. Um, I think I would, I think be okay with waiting until it's in when we're doing the bylaw rewrite. Like I don't think it's a priority at this moment. Um, however, I don't know how often you guys are having to do that application process. So for me, my question would be around that administration aspect. If that's a regular occurrence that you're getting applications, then I'd be willing to discuss doing it faster. Um, but if it's not, I'd be okay with it being with rewrite. I would like, when I look at Hinton's, um, I love the simplicity of that. It's very clear exactly what you're allowed to do. I'm okay with that timeline um, because if this is very clear, then if somebody doesn't, like obviously their permit is based on this, right? So if they're not following this, their billboard can be removed, right? They can lose their billboard, their uh, permit. Through the chair, yes. So we're not suggesting that we would have no clout to remove unsightly. We still have many mechanisms yeah. um, to remove unsightly anything within our uh, municipality. And on those permits that we issue for billboards, there's still a condition on those permits, just to ask, answer Councillor Wilkinson's concerns about the five-year validity. Um, there's still a condition that we place on every one of those permits. Um, and I try to place it on every permit that if your signage becomes in a state of, you know, disrepair. Right, okay. We can issue an order to you to remove it. And then there's there's follow through steps that follow that as well. Okay. So the remedy to order. And if it's followed through, I'm happy with that. Yeah. It's just, it's so unsightly when you have things in your town. That yes. That's what the public's seeing and yeah, it's a bad image. I think if I, if I may add to this, um, sure. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very supportive of simplifying this and, and, mm -hmm. and um, um, one of the things council asked or directed uh, you know, the development department is to bring these things forward and start getting them cleaned mm -hmm. up and, and changed and adjusted. Um, and, and we also want to make it easy for people to do business with us, et cetera. Yeah, and, and I would just suggest that um, the, um, the pieces of the puzzle come together <laughs> pretty clearly here that um, some minor adjustments in this would reduce administrative burden would make it easier for the purveyors of, of, of billboards to operate you know um you know those uh pieces in our community um and i, I don't think we would lose any ability to, de to deal with you know problematic signage that's yeah. something we still have and um it's clear also from the research that um, julia shared that we're an outlier in this five-year permitting process um we I think what we're ultimately saying is, is I, we, we consider these to be permanent structures, but we're asking to permit them every five years and we're just not, it just doesn't really make any sense to us to be quite frank. Um, when you get a permit for your house, you get your permit for your house and you have your permit for as long as the house is there. And, um, and unless you do some substantial changes to it, there's no reason for you to um, acquire another permit. Uh, and we're just recommending a similar dynamic for billboards. Thanks. Uh, through the chair to Ms. Darling. So if we were to go ahead and um, and allow a, a permanent permit to be issued, then does that start, uh, is that uh, grandfathered? Everybody that's already uh, had a permit may be renewed last year. Are they then now, um, uh, do they have to wait another four years? And then once they wait the four years, then they can have the permit? permit? 
I guess. <laughs> Through the charity council bar. So my intention, uh, of course, it would all come out in the wash once everything was approved. But my general intent would be that while they wouldn't be grandfathered in, we would reissue permanent permits for those people. Okay. Because if a permit has a condition that says it expires in five years, that's there. And there's nothing, I can't remove it without okay. replacing the permit. Okay. So the intention would be um, this year, I believe I had 13. So those 13 permits, um, if this wasn't something that we passed until a land use bylaw rewrite, at the time of rewrite, I, we would have some type of, of clause in there that says um, all existing billboard permits at this time will be reissued in accordance with this section of the bylaw. Okay. You had 13 billboard permits mm -hmm. this year? Yes. Mm -hmm. And is that the usual? Uh, last year there was eight, I believe. I, I but they reoccur every five. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean sorry. That. They reoccur every five years. Well, knowing um, the thirteen a year, I'd be willing to up that speed of having this bylaw rewritten um, and done sooner than the land use bylaw. Um, if it's knowing what you said about the time on it, that is a lot of uh, permits in one year. Through the chair. There's only two next year. If that, okay, if that changes yeah. your okay. situation, there's only two next year. Okay, it's not, okay. okay good. Yeah, so I, I think they're fairly cyclical as we have these 20 or so that are happening in these two years, and then we have very few for two or three years, okay. and then we have So we need to have it done before and, five years. Good years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need it done before the next 13. We also do think there's an, there's an element of certain, you know, like, um, you know, certainty that is really important to a business owner. And, you know, if you're going to make an investment of something like a billboard in our community, yeah. um, there's a big difference between investing in something for five years versus um, a more of an indefinite space as well. Mayor yeah. Sarah? Uh, less red tape gets my support every single time. So, uh, and I'm a big proponent of let's start chipping away at this stuff um, as much as we can and uh, something that we can use for our reports for municipal affairs as they talk about reducing red tape and wanting a report on red tape reduction. <laughs> How many pages? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I'm in favor of making it uh, simpler because, and then as far as the five year term, I have to agree with the comments because if you build a house, you don't renew every five years. And now that I read through it and comparing the other towns to make it simple makes it easy. Because uh, I'm sure if you talk to people in Hinton, they bitch about theirs or white cords, but just comparing them all, making it simple. And if it is, because some of the billboards in town are permanent structures that are built to be there for years to come. So take the five years out, but let's have some teeth in it, meaning that if it's in disrepair, it's falling down, that we have power that we can say, you have this time frame to fix it, or we have the power to take it down. Because that was a problem we had in the past. We had zero power to force them to maintain, maintain their sign. Councilor Ryan. Thanks. So through the Chair to Administration, um, I'm in favor of uh, working on this and, and uh, getting it ahead of the land, land use by law rewrite, uh, as well as um, you mentioned some possible changes to make it more efficient and better wording and um, uh, easier for our, our developers uh, of this infrastructure. Um, so I'd be in support of, of moving forward that way. Julia? Right. That's, That's great. Good enough. Well done. Thank you. All right. You're good. Thank you very much. Good job on your first round. You did great. All right. Moving on to Oak. Oh, Councillor Sorensen. Oak will cope with the sign. So moving on to grant application for the DGAS water treatment plant upgrades. This is Mr. Mann. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As we discussed in uh, early 2020, we need to upgrade our degas water treatment plant to bring disinfected water to the west end of town. Um, we would like to apply for a grant for this process and we will be requiring a resolution through council next week. However, the application will be going for the grant beforehand. As you can see, the deadline is November 30th, but we, uh, we hope to um, amend that application um, after we submit. 
Is anybody, is anybody opposed to applying no, to a for a grant? Very good. Thanks. Thanks. No, 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 no. Good. Great job, guys. You good? You good? All right. Moving on to. Thanks for staying here all night. For <laughs> <laughs> nice. I just like to listen to you guys. Yeah. Moving on to the sundry item that was at a G1 COVID signboards. Is that you too, Mr. Hamm? It is. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, in this one, we are looking for funding out of the COVID reserve for um, $30,000 per message board. Uh, the digital sign boards have been uh, extremely helpful in messaging throughout town through the pandemic, um, both with uh, landfill changes and with many of our messaging changes at the entrances of town. Um, as you'll see currently, um, the sign board uh, is messaging the mandatory mask bylaw uh, in effect. So. Um, we thought that maybe this could be supportive throughout the remainder of the pandemic and and then obviously and beyond that for messaging um, for any purposes with the town. Commissioner. Uh, thank you through to Mr. Hamm. Uh, I was a little surprised by the cost of those. I didn't think they'd be that expensive. Uh, would you be going with the same type as you have currently or would you be doing something a little bit more modern? Uh, we're looking to um, replace the or to buy the exact same ones so that we don't have any software interference and anything like that. So um, the cost increases come with the solar panels. So we are actually looking for um, a greater quote package. This is just an initial quote to give us some a template for the for the request. How many are we looking at buying? So two more. Council Schoenard, uh, two more would be the request. And then I'm trying to figure out from knows your cost of thirty thousand each. Is that correct? Correct. All it's not seven hundred thousand. That can't be right. No, <laughs> seven hundred thousand is what's in the reserve. Uh, thirty thousand dollars per message board is the is the current quote. Mayor's here. Full support. Um, we have a lot of uh, projects going on in the summer and. Sometimes there are different areas of town, snow removal, et cetera. We have various entry ways to neighborhoods, et cetera. And uh, we also have no backup if one of them goes down. So uh, I think it'd be good for an operational uh, item anyway. Um, and uh, I think we really need it now with what's going on with COVID. Because we still, in the next few months, we don't know what's going to be going on. Councilor Yeah, through, through through the chair to council i think uh, we should support this and i think with all the construction that's going to be going on in the area in the next couple of years we can definitely use this site as well through the chair to administration I'm, I'm in support of this um we uh i think currently utilize the the boards uh well and uh um some other communication that we use is on social media but not everybody that comes into our town is on social media um especially with all the workers we have at the pipeline and then cascade and multiplex um you know it just kind of gets amplified that um the different entries and exits um into town are are important to those groups as well especially when we have uh you know a mask by law or or anything else happening in the community so yeah i'm in support so That's we're talking and articulating sign no no this... we're driving to the landfill that sign you see I don't go to the landfill okay, how about coming it's in by Canadian tires set up the, the one on the trailer and it's orange and oh okay so, so it's, it's, it doesn't run it just it flashes at you. Okay. All right. All right. Um, yeah, I'm surprised at the cost then. Yeah. I'm in full support too. I find them really helpful. And I was super impressed when it was right out the day after the mass bylaw was right there coming into town. I think it's fantastic, especially like somebody said. We were thinking about moving it over in front of the county office this yeah. morning. <laughs> <laughs> we decided maybe. maybe oh, 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 oh. We didn't want it to get vandalized. Yeah, we right. hadn't got approved for two new ones yet. Uh, I do think, and I find them just really helpful, and I do agree with Councillor Breyer with visitors to town, but especially knowing that we have quite a high transient population with our workforce. Um, I think it is a great way to have them. So I'm in full support, and especially right now. Yes, good to go. All right, Ms. Chan, we have everything you need. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, did you want okay. thumbs up again? <laughs> Always. <laughs> okay, um, did we have any questions from the media and public regarding items from this committee of the whole meeting? Nothing. If you have questions, please submit them. Um, I'm going to call a quick, very quick recess before yes. we move into the closed session. Uh, not even five minutes. Quickest move. Okay. Okay. Um, can I get a motion to go in camera, please, so for a closed session? Mayor Sahara makes that motion. All in favor? 
motion. Not even the tiny <laughs> Can I get a motion for adjournment? <laughs> Councillor Schoenhardt, <laughs> make that motion. All in favor? Motion carried. I don't know if you can see me. Too.